By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Raging Bull series in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. This is episode number five and we have reached the top 16 and this is going to be super exciting. We have a dead guy ale deck, so that means white and black with four Juzam Jins. This is a beautiful deck to look at that's being piloted by Kuhn here in the top 16. And he is taking on Robert Jan and he's playing with a deck called BB-8. So that's robots but a little bit more aggressive than the usual robots mix. So this promises to be a very, very good and close match. Now, before I go to the deck deck, I've got beautiful deck pictures of both of these decks. I would just like to point out that as always, you can check the description below for timestamps and rules information. So if you wanna know more about this old school tournament and the rules, please check the description. If you wanna go to specific parts of this video, for instance, if you wanna go to the games or a specific deck deck, please use the timestamps below. They are there to help you go through the video, okay? So now that that's out of the way, I would like to start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of Kuhn, and that is the Dead Guy Ale Juzam Jin Madness deck. I'm just, I'm really looking forward to this. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Kuhn. So it is black and white, and we call that a Dead Guy Ale deck. And um, what you usually see with these decks is that you choose to invest more heavily in one color. In this case, it's obviously black, right? We see a lot of uh, double black, even triple black in the casting costs here. Uh, look, we've got four beautiful Juzam Jins. It's just insane, right? Two black and two for a 5-5 five, five powerhouse, a poster boy of Magic and of the Arabian Nights set. It's just beautiful to see this beast in the top 16. Then we also have four Underworld Dreams, of course, an absolute killer with a more aggressive strategy than this. You know, you deal a lot of damage and then all of a sudden there's this Underworld Dreams that's constantly pinging the opponent for drawing cards. Super annoying and very good against players that splash that blue power in their deck, you know? And I think the opponent, Robert Janovkun, is splashing that blue power. So maybe Underworld Dreams is gonna play a big role in this matchup. Then we also see four Hypnotic Spectres, four Black Knights in there. We see four Dark Rituals. That's kind of the, the black part. Of course, we see Mind Twist as well and um, a Demonic Tutor. That's kind of the no-brainer, right? And the nice thing is, if you wanna work with white, oh, I'm forgetting about the Sinkholes, by the way. Sinkhole, pretty important in this matchup because you really wanna have a way to deal with those pesky mazes of if. Juzam Jin does not like to go into a maze. You know, even even as a kid, that's the only, one, only thing that can scare him is a maze. They're just too complex. I mean, he likes to smash face, but he doesn't like to go into a maze, if you know what I mean, right? So you need those sinkholes to deal with the mazes of if. Then what I wanted to say is one of the nice things about white is you mainly play it for the spells and the spells are so easy to splash in your deck. Disenchant, just one white, right? One white and one, swords one white, balance one white and one. So it's really easy to play this as a second or sometimes even a third color in your deck because you don't need to commit that heavily to white in your mana pool, and especially with um, a format where you have access to dual lands, to Moxen, and of course the City of Brasses, it's quite easy to get those alternative mana colors if you only need one of them. Um, a pretty strong deck. What I would just like to uh, to mention here is when we're looking at the sideboard, we do see four Suchis, and of course they're there to go in uh, into the deck instead of the Jews and Jins in case that the opponent starts playing a city in a bottle. So that's always quite, quite clever. When you go heavy into an Arabian Nights creature, you always have to keep in the back of your mind, what do I do if my opponent boards in a city in a bottle? Unfortunately, it is, you know, the reality of today's old school magic meta. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Now, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Robert Jan, who's playing with BB-8. And here we see the deck of Robert Jan. So this is BB-8 and it's, uh, it's a robot deck but more aggressive. Um, I think first off, let's look at the creature base. So we see four trikes, four suchis, nothing special there. And I think when you're playing this deck, you wanna do kind of what most robot decks want to do. And that is ramp up with your mox and the mana volts, get your trike out ASAP, and then start copying it with copy artifact and just put the pressure on. And with this deck, you can be quite aggressive with those counters on the trike because there's a ton of direct damage in this deck. We've got four side blasts, four lightning bolts. This deck is brutal, you know? If you're drawing the right pieces at the right time with this deck, there's hardly a chance of, of winning against this. You know, it's it's a brutal, brutal machine. Um, there is a weakness here, I think, and that is that there are quite a lot of mana sources. So there could be situations here where you just draw mocks upon mocks and a Volt and a Felwer Stone and yet another land, 
and that you have a lot of copy artifacts in your hand, but nothing to copy. You know, those could be kind of moments where, um, you know, the deck isn't finding the right components. And then, of course, there's a chance for the opponent. Uh, in this particular matchup, there's one card I'd like to highlight here, and that is the Abyss. I think the, the Abyss is quite good because Kuhn is, is running a creature-heavy strategy. The Abyss hits all his creatures. Of course, Kuhn has a disenchant, but a well-timed Abyss could be really, really brutal for Kuhn. Another card that's quite brutal for him is um, uh, the, the City in a Bottle. And the City in a Bottle is not just good against those Jews and Jins, but it's also good against the City of Brasses in the deck of Kuhn. And now we see Robert John is only running one main, so that's not a huge issue, uh, but he's also running one in his uh, in his main board. I was thinking, by the way, and I, I, I think I know why they're not playing it, but maybe Transmute Artifact could be quite an interesting card to run in uh, in this deck as well. You know, to find that trike if you need it and kind of get that whole copy artifact trike machine going. But the danger with, of course, uh, a card like Transmute Artifact is you basically pay two cards to to get one card, right? So it is a two for one. So it's not always ideal. But it's just when I'm looking at this list, I'm thinking maybe a Transmute Artifact could be interesting as a one-off uh, in this deck, although you already have a Demonic Tutor, of course, to do some searching as well. So maybe you, you don't really need it. Anyway, just a random thought that came into my head looking at this list. I also know that uh, we've had some comments before where people were suggesting to put a Fireball in here and take a Psionic Blast out. I think that's also an interesting idea. I think the the creator of this deck, uh, Richard or creators, Richard and Hank, I think they really love instant speed and they're not such a big fan of sorcery speed. So that's their main reason to go with uh, with, an, with another Psy Blast instead of that one uh, one Fireball. But but looking at all that mana acceleration, Fireball could really work well in this deck uh, also. Okay, we've looked at the deck of Robert John. We discussed the deck of Kuhn. That means we're ready. Let's go to the top 16 of the Raging Bull series. Game number one, here we go, and we see Robert John, he's on the play, he's on the Timmy playmat, playing with BB-8, so the Robots deck, and on the left, we see Kuhn, who's playing with the White and Black Dead Guy Ale deck, with Juzam Jins. Let's see if uh, if Kuhn can have an explosive start here, maybe turn one Juzam, that would be quite sweet. Let's see what he can do. Just playing a Mishra's Factory, it looks like, yep, and he is passing turn. There is a strip mine and a pass by Robert John. I believe I see a copy artifact in hand there and a chaos orb, for example. Is that a mind twist as well? Anyway, a land being played out here by Kuhn in the past turn. So quite a slow start for both players. Tapping two here. There's that chaos orb. He's probably going to keep it. He wants to copy it next turn. That's what I think he does. Another option, of course, would be to play it quite aggressively on the land base here. But it's probably better just to copy it next turn. Keep the options open, and if Kuhn can now find a white source, and, ha and if he has a disenchant in hand, that would be kind of ideal for Kuhn, because then in response to the copy artifact being played out by Robert John, he could play a disenchant. Just finding a, a second swamp, though, so that's not ideal. Doesn't have a sinkhole in hand, it seemed, seems, or else he would have played it. There's another volcanic. Is he going to play the copy artifact now? You're kind of safe, right? I mean, Kuhn has no white mana, so just go copy that thing. Exactly. Copy Artifact on the Chaos Orb. Is he going to flip it now? He is going to flip it. I think that's a good decision. I, I would do the same. Be quite aggressive here. And taking his time. Ooh, did you see that? It went on the side and whoop. Then it went, that's a weird way to flip, but very, well, weird. It's actually a beautiful way to flip it over to you. I'm very stylish, but let me know in the comments if that was your intention or if you were just lucky. Maybe that's the way you always flip. I don't know. I haven't seen you flip that often. There's another black. There's a Mox Jet, so three black sources here. Can he play out like, for example, Hypnotic Spectre? I would at least put some pressure on. Ooh, there's a Mind Twist. I like this. This is very good. So he's only going to keep one card. Remember, he also has a Mind Twist in hand, I believe. He's losing his Mind Twist, so that's ideal here for Kuhn. This is very important, this, uh, this Mind Twist here by Kuhn. Let's see what Robert John can do. Drawing card number two. And just passing the turn. Okay, all of a sudden, after that Mind Twist... There are a few options here now. He's got a City of Brass in hand. 
And he's not playing the City of Brass out because he is waiting for the moment. Is Are we going to see a Juice M. Jin? Juice M. Jin, baby! <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it, I love it! 5-5 five, five Powerhouse. Yes, we do have that Chaos Herb that he's going to use on the Juice M. But still, it's great to see it in action. And what I wanted to say is Kun is keeping that City of Brass uh, safe, of course. He's only going to play it until he needs a white source. And now we see a copy artifact again on the Chaos Orb. So I think we're going to see a flip here. And you can see Robert Johnny's thinking, maybe I should wait, but he's deciding to do it now. Oh, and that's a miss. That is a miss. Is he gonna flip it again? Is he gonna flip it again? No, he's not. Taking a damage from the Jews, I'm going to 19. Wow, attacking here, and now he's gonna use it. He's gonna flip. Now he's going to take a moment, and now it's a hit. So he, he took more time for this one. You see that? He stood up. He took his time. It's so funny with Chaos Orbs. But still, I mean, two Chaos Orbs to get rid of one Juice MGN. That's good value here for Kun. He can, of course, still animate his Mishra's Factory and attack with it. There is a Maze of If. Tapping four. There's another Juice M. Wow, I'm already loving this first game. How great. And now he has no answer for the Juzam. So now he can start attacking. And remember, Robert John is not playing Swords. He's playing Psy Blast, only deals 4 damage. And Bolt only deals 3 damage. So it's pretty tough for, for Robert John to actually get rid of the Juzam Jin. That was a nice hit by the Juzam. Is there anything else that he could do? Maybe he's put some more pressure here on the board. Just passing turn though. But things are really looking good. For Kun, and Robert John has to find an answer here. Tapping five. What could it be? Brain guys are not too shabby. He's going to draw three cards. Hasn't played out a land yet. So three cards here for Robert John. I see a Suchi, a Trike. The other one I couldn't really spot. But no lands, though. If he can get one more land, he can start playing out his Triskelions. And of course he's going to attack here. Robert John is now on 10. This is very exciting stuff. He's not attacking with the factory, by the way. Does that mean he wants to play something out? No, he's passing turn. He's missed two extra points of damage here. Could have put Robert John on 8 if he would have animated the factory. And remember, Robert John was tapped out as well. There's the abyss. Oh, that is, that is a killer here. And also kind of a flavor of fail. The Jews and Jinnam, surely he's not afraid of the Abyss. But he can, I guess he can fall into the Abyss. So I, I guess it's possible. Anyway, let's see if Kuhn can find a Disenchant. Abyss is a very strong card against Kuhn. Most of his creatures are affected by it. He could, of course, still attack here with the Mishra's Factory deal in at least two points of damage. And then, of course, you take a risk that maybe he's going to kill the factory with a bolt. But it looks like he's got enough mana anyway. Okay, putting the two together. Is he going to cast something still? No, he's going to animate the factory to attack for two. And then we see the bolt. You know, at least it's a bolt out of the hand of Robert John. And, you know, I kind of feel that, you know, Kuhn has enough mana sources as is right now. So I, I, I understand this play. It kind of makes sense. And he's now in his second main, trying to decide if he wants to do something else as well. Robert John now tapped out, of course. Tapping two black. Ooh, interesting. He's going to cast a Demonic Tutor. Is he going to look up, for example, a Disenchant to get rid of the Abyss? So he's going to go through his deck. And he's found his card, he's going to shuffle up, and he's going to pass the turn to Robert John, he's going to untap, upkeep, draw. And things are looking very good now for, uh, for Robert John. Tapping two, there's a Felwer Stone. Tapping four, okay, there's a Suchi. And a pass turn. Now remember, Kuhn still has the Maze of If. 
playing another swamp. Going through his hand, trying to find a way to put pressure on. I wonder what card he's looked up. Was it the disenchant? And if so, is he going to play it out? I mean, Abyss is just so good. And right now, Robert John is tapped out, so he cannot counter. So I would just, I would just play out disenchant. If he has it, I would play it out right now on the Abyss. Yeah, there's the disenchant. Okay. So getting rid of the Abyss. Tapping three, and there is Hypnotic Spectre. This is really good. Flies over to Suchi, of course. Remember, Robert John does have a trike in hand. If he can just play out the trike, he can shoot down the Hypnotic Spectre. He has six mana now. First the attack, sending it back with the maze. Going to play a Mana Vault. Interesting choice to play the Mana Vault. I think I, I would have just stepped out for the trike. Maybe he's got something else in hand that he wants to be able to play out next turn. That could, of course, be an option. Ooh, Psionic Blast. Interesting. Going to go down to eight. So he didn't want to play out the trike anyway. So then, then this line of play kind of makes sense, I guess. I would have gone for a slightly different line. I would have played out the trike. Killed the hippie and past turn. But then again, I don't know what's in the hand of Robert John. And of course, I don't, you know, I haven't played his deck at all. So who am I to decide what the correct line of play is? But it's always interesting to discuss the different scenarios. There's another Juzam Jin, by the way. Juzam Jin number three. I am so loving your deck, Kun. It's fantastic. It's phenomenal. And again, the problem for Robert John here is the fact that Juzam Jin has five toughness. Look at him go here, tapping the vault. Okay, untapping it again, changing his mind. No, he's tapping the vault. Going to go to six mana. He's going to play out the trike, trike number one. What else is there in his hand? Is there another side blast in hand, for example? He can ping the... Is there? Oh, there's a copy artifact. Okay, so now he's going to copy it. This is really good news for Robert John. So what he can do now, of course, just with the counters on the trikes, he can already kill the Juzam Jin. Bad news here for, uh, for Kundert. But he wants to respond on the copy artifact. So in response of the copy, he sorts to plowshares the first trike. And that kind of makes sense. So three damage to the face here of, uh, of Kuhn. And now he's got to choose another target for the copy artifact. So he's going to choose the Suchi and pass turn. Now Kuhn, of course, has to take a damage here from the Juzam, so he would go to 10. Exactly. The problem here for Kuhn is if he attacks, Robochan can just double block on two Suchis and then put all the damage on one Suchi and kill his Juzam. So that's kind of a bad trade. He is doing it. Nonetheless, interesting. Oh, because there's another Juzam. Juzam number four, I believe. This is insane. I love this, man. I love this. When I saw your deck list, Kun, I was kind of hoping that you might be able to play out one of your Juzams, but you're really treating us here with four Juzam Jins in game number one. This is fantastic. Robert John taking a damage. No, untapping the Mana Vault, so not taking a damage. Drawing a card for turn. That copy artifact is a Suchi. And I mean, things are looking bad here for Robert John. What he needs is, is basically a draw seven, you know. A Wheel of Fortune would be quite nice. So he's going to untap, take a damage, going to drop to nine. Both players on nine now, by the way. This is really an entertaining game number one. Three cards in hand for Kuhn. I mean, you just want to swing, right? Just attack. Maybe Robert John has, has a bolt. He can block and bolt. Okay, whatever. But he does not, so he's going to... Or, or he does. He's blocked on the Suchi. What does that mean? There we see a Chaos Orb. And there's a Bolt. Okay, so robert John did have the Bolt. So he's able to take care of those Jews and Jins. I would almost start playing with the Raised Deads here in the deck of Kun. 
just to get those juice amps back, you know? So there's an untap again. And there's a pass. So Kuhn kind of drawing blanks, Zorba John kind of drawing blanks. He is counting his mana though. That was an interesting moment there. And there's the pass turned by Robert Young. And there's the pass again by Kuhn. So both players really top decking mode, trying to find a threat. And I think if you're Kuhn, it's really too bad that he's already, you know, lost all his Juzams. They've done great work for him, but still, you know, all the other creatures are kind of easy, uh, you know, for Robert Young to get rid of. What would be really good right now as well for, for Kuhn would just be an Underworld Dreams, just to put some pressure on Drobachan's uh, life total. And also it would make it kind of difficult for, you know, Robert John to, to, to play out his Ancestral Recall if he finds one or play out, you know, a draw seven in the form of a Wheel of Fortune. Tapping two here, what is he going to play out? Are we going to see a Sinkhole? Because he was kind of looking at the mana base. Doesn't really matter that much, especially with the Felwer Stone and the City of Brass and all the other duels, but it's gonna go for the Underground Sea. I guess it makes sense. It, it means he only has two black sources then after, in the form of the Felwer Stone and the Moxjet. There we see a Mishra's Factory and a Pass. The nice thing here is that both players also know that the Mind Twists are out of the game, so you can kind of like hoard the card safely. Because sometimes it can be risky if you know your opponent is probably playing Mind Twist, you know. You just want to get rid of your cards a little bit quicker than usual. Here we see another Mishra's Factory. So that means that starting next turn, Robert John can put on some pressure by attacking with both factories. So many cards in hand for Kuhn. What could they be? I believe there are six cards in there. And just to pass, though. Maybe he's got a lot of answers, like Disenchants and stuff. Swords to Plowshares. And I wonder if Robert John is thinking the same. He's like, you know what? If I animate my factories, they're probably just going to die to Disenchants and Swords. Do I really want that? Maybe the answer is yes. I mean... Then he ways to disenchant on your factory. Fine. So he's going to pay two. He's going to play... Ooh, copy artifact to copy the Chaos Orb. That is quite interesting. He's going to copy the Chaos Orb. Now I wonder if Kuhn's going to respond by activating the Chaos Orb. And Chaos Orb, of course on the side of Robert John would be really useful because then he can get rid of that one maze of if and he can start dealing some more damage with his factories. So Kuhn really in a tough position here. What he could do, of course, is in response, use the Chaos Orb and flip on a factory. That wouldn't be too bad, I think. And again, I don't, of course, know what's in the hand here of Kuhn. Maybe Kuhn has a disenchant in hand and he thinks, you know what? I don't really mind you copying my Chaos Orb because if you activate it in response, I can disenchant it anyway. And he's allowing it here. And then we see Robert John motioning towards the Chaos Orb saying, okay, I'm copying your Chaos Orb. He's going to tap the Mana Vault. No, he's untapping it again. He's going to tap. Is he going to tap the Mana Vault for three? Nope. He's going to activate both factories and swing in with two Mishra's factories. He's kind of hoping that Robert John will respond with a disenchant on his swords to plowshares, meaning that he can after that use his Chaos Orb without any concern. There we see a tap. Are we going to see swords to plowshares? I think we do. There is a Swords to Plowshares, so that means two more life for Robert John, going back up to 11. Then he's going to send back the other uh, factory, I assume, exactly. And there's the pass. Interesting, I felt that Robert John could now use the Chaos Orb 
to try to get rid of uh, of the maze. Of course, then in response, Kun could use his maze again, but then at least the board would be free of mazes. On the other hand, Robert Jan is of course the copy artifact player, so maybe he wants a Chaos Orb to be in play. Very interesting match. And I mean, both players are kind of going through their resources quite quick. Here we see an activation of the Chaos Orb of Kun. And now I think Robert Jan can respond by activating his Chaos Orb. It looks like they're discussing it and trying to find out what the best line of play is here. So if Kun is activating it, then Robert Jan can activate it in response. So let's wait and see what both players are going to do. I mean, I think if you're Robert Young, you don't really need to respond. I would just let Kun flip. Because if he's going to flip on the factory, okay, you lose a factory. But then after that, you can flip on the mace, which is equally important. If he's going to flip on the orb, okay, then you get the same result as if you would have activated the orb. So... I think I would just let Kun flip. You know, people miss flips, especially in, 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 in a top 16 scenario. Here's the flip on the Chaos Orb here of Robert Jung. It is a hit. We're seeing a, a lot of flips, man, in this game one. A lot of Jews and Jins. I kind of feel that we're, we're being spoiled here by Robert Jung and, uh, and Kun. There is the Underworld Dream. So this is probably the main reason that Kuhn really wanted to get rid of that uh, Chaos Orb on the side of Robert Jung. This can grant him the victory. It doesn't just deal damage to Robert Jung, but it also makes it difficult for him to play out, you know, Ancestral Recall and Wheel of Fortune, which are two great cards to kind of get back into the game. Here we see a Wheel of Fortune. And he's not attacking here with the factory. I'm really surprised. I expect him to attack, see Kuhn use the Maze of If on the, the factory, then the next turn, you know, Robert Young could have attacked again. There we see a city in a bottle is coming a little bit late after all the Jews and Jins are already gone. At least it takes care of the city of Brass. It could be important, actually, because it's a, it's a white source for Kuhn. So who knows? And Kuhn looking at his hand again. I mean, Kuhn is still on 8. Robert Jan on 9 is going to drop to 8 next turn probably because of that Underworld Dreams. Four cards in hand for Robert Jan and I believe five cards in hand for Kuhn. So Kuhn is really, really in the tank, tapping two now for, okay, a Black Knight. That's something, of course, the problem with these 2-2 two -two creatures, uh, creatures is that you have to deal with a Mishra's factory that can pump itself. That makes it really difficult. There's a Volcanic Island and a pass. And of course, Robert John taking a damage from the Underworld Dreams is going to go to 8. I mean, there's no need to rush here for Kuhn. He can just, uh, you know, take it easy. And there is the pass. So Robert John going to drop to seven. And there's a pass. Is he going to play another Underworld Dreams? No, he's going to play an Hypnotic Spectre. But that's also a problem for Robert Young. If he doesn't have an answer, it's going to go to six. 
I mean, Robichan is slowly dying here. Because of that Underworld Dreams, there is a Suchi. And a pass, and I wonder if Robert-Chan has a Bolt or a Psyblast to deal with that Hypnotic Spectre. There's the attack with the Hippie. There's the Bolt. I mean, this is also good news for Kun, because Kun's on 8, right? Playing out the Scrubland now. Does it mean that he's got a Disenchant in hand? Robert-Chan dropping to 5. I believe he found a Wheel of Fortune there, which of course is a card that he cannot play at the moment because of the Underworld Dreams. And Robert John really in the tank here, passing turn. There's another pass. Robert John going to drop to four. I think I see a Sylvan Library there in the hand of Robert John that he, of course, cannot play because of his own city in a bottle. And it wouldn't be great now because of the Underworld Dreams. It's going to drop to three. Ooh, is Robert John really going to die to that one Underworld Dreams? Trying to play out the library, but he can because of the city. Takes it back, passes the turn. He's starting to feel desperate here. Three life, three more turns to go, three more draw steps. And he is dead. He's done for in game number one. There we see Kunder tapping three, playing another Underworld Dreams, accelerating the process. That means next turn, that Robert Chan is taking two damage, going to drop to one. Another Scrubland by Kuhn. Attacking here with the Black Knight. He has to block, of course. He's going to block with the Suchi. Are we going to see a Disenchant? There is a Disenchant on the Suchi before damage is dealt. So the Black Knight survives. Look at that, Robert-Chan taking two damage. Because of the double Underworld Dreams. And here you can really see what a good card Underworld Dreams is. And I, I think this is it. Or are they discussing what card Robert John now needs? I don't, th I don't think there is a card that can save Robert John at this point. Yep, that's it. Okay, game number one. One here by Kuhn. And what an exciting first game it was. And I now really wonder... Uh, how they are going to sideboard. So we'll, we'll, we'll let them sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two, here we go. Can Robert John turn it around? So he's one game behind, needs to win this one to stay in it. Starting pretty good here with a Soul Ring. So perhaps he could have his Suchi turn two. Ooh, Library of Alexandria here for Kuhn. This is bad news, of course, for Robert John. He's got some weapons against it, but okay, there we see a weapon against it. City in a bottle. And at least Kuhn gets one card out of it, but uh, this is ideal for Robert John having that card in hand. Attacking for two here, a card from the sideboard and passing turn. Let's see what Kuhn can do. I wonder now if he boarded out his Jews Amps. If he did not, this, this may be a very uh, difficult match for him. Starting with the Mox Jet now and a Swamp, so he's ramping up again. A sinkhole would be nice. I think we're going to see one here. Yep, there's a sinkhole. Takes care of a land and of some incoming damage. He is tapped out now, so that does mean that Robert John, if he wants to, can attack again for two without taking any risk. And that's exactly what he does. He's going to attack again, putting Kuhn here on 16. So, so far it's looking quite well here for Robert John. Maybe he would have liked a Suchi. But uh, an attack for two is also good. Does Kuhn have white mana? Does he have a disenchant, for example, in hand? And he could drop a white source, pass the turn, and disenchant the factory if Robert John attacks with it. That's kind of a line of play. That's an option. But playing a Mishra's factory instead into a soul ring, having four mana available, tapping four. There we see Suchi. So Suchi coming in from the sideboard, I believe. 
and um, he took out his Juzam's, uh, Juzam Jins, which is a good decision looking at the city in a bottle on the side of Robert John. And there is a Psyblast taking care of that Suchi. Doesn't mean two damage for Robert John, but now he can also swing in with his factory putting Kun here on 14. Let's see what Kun can do. So from the get-go, he's been under some pressure. It looked like a great start for him with the Library of Alexandria, but then there was that City in a Bottle turn two play by Robert Young. Let's see if Kun has an answer, maybe a wide source again for the possible disenchant or perhaps another sinkhole. Looks like he's gonna do something, maybe another Suchi. That could be an option as well, of course. Tapping four here. We see a Mind Twist. Ooh, that is brutal. Mind Twist for three. And we see a Black Lotus, a land, and then there's one more card. I can't really see what it is. I think the Abyss. And there is a Strip Mine on the Factory and a Pass. So this is a pretty good turn for Kuna. I mean, he took care of the hand of Robert John and he took care of the only threat. And now Robert John is doing the same, but of course Kun still has three cards in hand and that's the big difference here now. Now he's got four cards in hand, so this is bad news for Robert John. Has to find that Wheel of Fortune perhaps. There we see a Hippie, 2-2 two -two Flyer. And just a pass here from Robert John after playing that Mox Sapphire. So he's on top deck mode, so it's looking really good now all of a sudden for Kun. This is of course the power of Mind Twist. Robert John dropping to 16. Tapping three here, what is he gonna do next? One black, two colorless. There's a demonic tutor, so he's got one floating. Interesting, what is he going to look up? Looking up uh, a white source. And passing the turn, so he's scrubland. And only mana sources for Robert John. This is really bad for him here. This is the decisive game. He's got to do something back. Or it is the end of the road for Robert John and his BBA deck here at the Raging Bull series. There's an attack. And it's really nice to see a deck without blue power doing so well. That's really an accomplishment by Kuhn here. Who's playing out another Scrubland. Tapping four. What is he going to play? There's an Underworld Dreams. I think that Underworld Dreams is very important. He's tapping three, by the way. And this is really difficult because now even if Robert John top decks, for example, a Wheel of Fortune, it's going to hurt him a lot to play it out. There's a Suchi. Unfortunately, Suchi doesn't fly, but at least it's something. Quick response though. A Divine Offering. That, that means some life for Kuhn here as well. Going to go up to 18. I mean, he's really in the driver's seat here. Putting Robert John on 11. Adding more... Damage here in the form of an Underworld Dreams. That means Robert John's gonna take two damage per draw step. Gonna go to nine. This is gonna go really, really fast. Robert John at least needs something against the Hippie. A Bolt or something and then kind of, I don't know, hope for the best. It's also hard with the colors that he plays to deal with uh, enchantments. He's tapping, yes, yeah, Cyblast, but it does mean he takes two more damage. Gonna go to seven, means next turn he's gonna go to five. We saw it in game one, Underworld Dreams was decisive there as well, and we're seeing it now in game number two also. The Dreams is just this ongoing clock that you're uh, put on as the opponent, which is very difficult, especially in a deck that has no access to white, to disenchant. No, that's it, look at that, oh ho ho ho, Kuhn! And his, um, I wouldn't say underpowered, but blue powerless deck is moving on here at the Raging Bulls series. What an accomplishment here for Kuhn, reaching the top four with his deck. Well, well done. Here we can see uh, his deck photo. Thank you very much, Kuhn, for bringing this deck to, Raging Bull, to the Raging Bull series. And of course, also a big thank you for Robert John for showing your skills right here on the channel. Unfortunately, um, you know, your, your road, your adventure at Raging Bull ends here. But I mean, you made it to the top eight, which is a very good accomplishment. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a great matchup. Good to see. I, I always like three games, so unfortunately it was a 2-0, but it is what it is. Now, if you'd like to see more action from the Raging Bull series, please make sure to come back um, next week because then we have more action from this fantastic tournament held in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And before you go, if you're new to the channel, welcome to Timmy Talks. Please take a moment to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. 
And then there are also some things that you can do that are completely free and really support the, uh, the channel. And that is hit that like button, share this on your socials and also leave a comment down below. All that really helps and tells YouTube that you're enjoying the content right here on Timmy Talk. So you're really supporting the channel by doing those three things. Now then there's one the last thing you can do to support the channel and that is becoming a patron of the show. And how does that work? It's quite simple. Just visit patreon.com slash Timmy Talks and have a look at the website. So you can already support the show with $1 a month. So it's not a lot. And to be honest, you get a lot back for that because for that $1, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. And you also get access to the Timmy Talks Discord server and you can join the Timmy Talks online tournaments. So all that for just a dollar. And of course you can donate more if you want to. It's a, it's a great help. And thanks to the patrons and channel members, I am keeping this channel alive. So you know what? Let's have a look at who these people are. Let's go to the end scroll. Ich bin ein Sumba-Kazik.